that are based. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nikola Corporation's second quarter 2020 earnings call. With me today is Mark Russell, Chief Executive Officer of Nikola, and Kim Brady, our Chief Financial Officer. During today's call, we will make certain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. Forward-looking statements are predictions, projections, and other statements about future events that are based on current expectations and assumptions, and as a result, are subject to risks and uncertainties. Many factors could cause actual future events to differ materially from the forward-looking statements in this communication. For more information about factors that may cause actual results to materially differ from forward-looking statements, please refer to the earnings press release we issued today as well as the risk factors section of our current report on Form 8K as amended that we filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission June 8th and June 9th, 2020, in addition to the company's subsequent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Forward-looking statements speak only as to the date they are made. Readers are cautioned not to put undue reliance on forward-looking statements. With that, I will now hand the call over to Mark Russell. Thanks, Breton. This is really exciting, Nikola's first conference call as a public company. Going public through a business combination with Vector IQ was a critical step for us. It's laid the groundwork for us to accomplish our objective of becoming the global leader in zero emissions transportation. I'll start with an overview of the business, cover the milestones we were able to hit in the quarter, and then finally overview our strategy for executing going forward. Kim will then go over the numbers. Nikola is a vertically integrated zero emissions transportation systems provider. We design and manufacture battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, along with the battery charging systems and hydrogen fueling stations to power them. Our core global offering centers on heavy commercial trucks. Our long haul commercial transport solution is especially unique with a revolutionary bundled lease or freight as a service model. We provide customers with a fuel cell electric truck, the hydrogen fuel it needs, and all scheduled maintenance for a fixed total cost. All the customer needs to provide is a driver. This approach has proven very attractive and many customers are finding that they will be able to transition to zero emissions without an increase in total cost compared to their current fossil fuel solution. Our fuel cell electric truck reservation book exceeded 14,000 units or approximately 10 billion in potential revenue some time ago. Since then, we focused our efforts on direct partnerships with customers who have dedicated routes. Rolling out our hydrogen station network along corporate customers' dedicated routes or milk runs allows us to guarantee a high degree of hydrogen station utilization and avoid speculative investments in fueling infrastructure. Stations are being developed based on known customer demand along established dedicated routes. During the quarter, we signed an order for 85 megawatts of alkaline electrolyzer capacity from Nell ASA, which is enough to build five of our base eight-ton hydrogen production and dispensing stations. At full capacity, these stations can produce 40,000 kilos of hydrogen every day, which is enough to fuel up to 1,100 trucks. This milestone marks the beginning of the construction of our hydrogen station network. During the quarter, we also hired Pablo Kozener as president of Nikola's energy company. Pablo is a 19-year veteran of Caterpillar, who most recently served as president of CATS Solar Turbines subsidiary. Pablo brings extensive experience in global energy generation and distribution to our team, and he'll be leading the implementation of our energy strategy across the globe, starting with the initial tranche of stations I just referenced. Nikola and Aveco started modifications to our dedicated facility in Ulm, Germany during the quarter to meet our target of commencing serial production of the Nikola tray there in 2021. The first trucks produced from this facility will be exported to customers in the United States, but it will eventually be dedicated solely to supplying customers in Europe. 
the facility will have a capacity of up to 10,000 trucks per year when complete. Nikola also recently broke ground on its Greenfield Manufacturing Facility in Coolidge, Arizona. We expect phase one of this facility to be complete about a year from now, with limited manufacturing starting there before the end of 2021. Once phase two and three are completed in 2022 and 2023 respectively, the facility will have a capacity of 35,000 units a year on two shifts. We estimate we'll have spent a total of $600 million by the time all three phases are complete. We've partnered with Walbridge, a leading facility construction expert, to ensure that we complete the facility on time and on budget. All of our manufacturing activity is now being overseen by Mark Duchesne. He's our newly hired head of global manufacturing. Mark is a 22-year veteran of Toyota and a five-year veteran of Tesla. As director of operations at Tesla, he oversaw the installation of the innovative Model S and Model X production lines at Tesla Fremont, and he was subsequently responsible for assembly, manufacturing, and engineering there. At Toyota, Mark developed a $900 million greenfield facility from beginning to end and was subsequently responsible for process efficiency, product quality, and capacity improvements there. With that, I'll turn it over to Kim to review the numbers. Thanks, Mark. I would like to provide a review of our public market activity and second quarter financial results. On June 3rd, we completed our business combination with Vector IQ and subsequently listed on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol NKLA. The transaction provided an additional $616.7 million of cash on the balance sheet and put us in a strong liquidity position to execute our business plan. As a result of the transaction, we incurred one-time cost of $51.5 million, including advisory, legal, counting, and other fees. Following the close of the transaction on June 3, 2020, our ownership structure consisted of 77.2% ownership by legacy Nikola shareholders, 8.2% ownership by public Vector IQ shareholders and SPAC sponsors, and 14.6% by PIPE investors. Total outstanding shares before warrants were $360.9 million. In June and July 2020, as required by the terms of the business combination agreement, we filed two separate resale S1s to register 52.5 million pipe investor shares, 23.9 million public and private warrants, and 249 million. 8 million shares of common stock comprise mainly of legacy Nikola shares. Both S1s have since been declared effective by the SEC. On July 22nd, we announced the redemption of public warrants. Assuming all public warrants are exercised into common shares, this will provide Nikola up to additional $265 million of cash on the balance sheet. As of July 30th, 2020, approximately 18,070,302 warrants, representing 78% of all outstanding public warrants, had been exercised, providing Nikola with an additional $207.8 million of cash on the balance sheet. As of July 27th, all 360.9 million outstanding shares post-business combination have been fully registered, as well as additional 23 million shares from Warren Redemption have become part of the float. Focusing on the results in the second quarter, net loss was $86.6 million, and on a non-GAAP basis, adjusted EBITDA totaled negative $47 million. Adjusted EBITDA excludes $38.2 million in stock-based compensation and $1.5 million in depreciation and amortization. Research and development expenses were $42.5 million, 
which includes 2.9 million of stock-based compensation expense. R&D expenses consist mainly of costs incurred in the development of Nikola Trebev and Nikola II fuel cell electric vehicle trucks, as well as power sports products. This cost include the following. Personnel costs for our in-house engineering and research functions. Expenses related to materials, supplies, and third-party services. Fees paid to third parties such for outside development. Evacuating client services for vehicle integration, product validation, and engineering support. And depreciation for our R&D facilities and prototyping equipment. We expect our research and development costs to increase for the foreseeable future to achieve our technology and product roadmap. During the second quarter of 2020, we incurred approximately 44.1 million of SGNA expenses, of which 35.3 million is stock-based compensation expense. SGNA expenses consist principally of the following cost, personnel related to expenses for corporate departments, professional fees related to legal, accounting, and financial advisory fees, public company costs such as insurance, SEC fees, and compliance costs. We expect our SGNA expenses to increase for the foreseeable future as we scale headcount with the growth of our business and as a result of operating as a public company. Our total headcount now exceeds 370 FTEs and is growing at a major but steady pace as we continue to build our team. The net loss per share, basic and diluted, in the second quarter was negative 33 cents per share on a gap basis and 16 cents per share on a non-gap basis. The weighted average shares outstanding were $303.8 million. As we are in a net loss position, the fully diluted share count is not utilized for our EPS calculation. Turning to the balance sheet, we ended the second quarter with approximately $698 million of cash and cash equivalents on our balance sheet, excluding $8.9 million of restricted cash. We currently have no debt outstanding, aside from 4.1 million equipment loan fully secured by restricted cash on our balance sheet. Our capital expenditures totaled 6.9 million year to date, which comprised mostly of investments in R&D equipment. With the groundbreaking of phase one of our Greenfield Manufacturing Facility in Coolidge, Arizona, we anticipate capex to increase significantly over the next 12 months. Now to the full year 2020 outlook. As a pre-revenue company, the best way to monitor our progress and execution would be to hold us accountable for achieving certain milestones rather than earnings. However, the following provides our general expectations for the year in regards to our operating expenses. Estimated R&D for 2020 is in the range of 190 to 200 million, which includes approximately 10 million of stock compensation expense. Estimated SGNA for 2020 is in the range of 175 to 185 million, which includes approximately 130 million of stock compensation expense. We expect average shares outstanding of approximately $385 million in the second half of 2020. The milestones that we should be measured against are as follows. Announcement of a significant commercial agreement for Nikolai Zero Emission BV Trucks by end of 2020. Announcement of an OEM partner for the Nikolai Badger by end of 2020. Announcement of a hydrogen station collaboration by end of 2020. Completion of modification to our JV manufacturing facility in Ohm, Germany by end of 2020. 
completion of phase one of our Greenfield Manufacturing Facility in Coolidge, Arizona by Q4 2021. This concludes our prepared remarks and we'll now open the line for questions. Our first question comes from Jeff Osborne with Cowan & Company. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, good afternoon, guys, and uh, thanks for the detail on the call. Just a, a couple questions on my end. Um, I appreciate the uh, the commentary about the, the expense structure. That's certainly helpful. Um, Kim, uh, how should we think about CapEx for the year? Great question. For CapEx, as you know, especially for the second half of the year, <clears throat> we have number of CapEx items in mind in terms of tooling and equipment as well as kick off, kicking off hydrogen stations as well as other softwares. We also have kickoff of CapEx related to phase one manufacturing. We suspect for the second half of the year that our CapEx will be approximately $87 million. In addition, on top of that, we should see around $25 million. So essentially, you got about $100 million of CapEx in the second half of the year, including phase one manufacturing. Got it. And then um, I appreciate you setting out the milestones. Um, a couple questions on those, uh, recognizing you're limited. Um, is, is there any way you can frame what a, a significant commercial agreement is? Is that, you know, order of magnitude of, of what Budweiser was for fuel cells, or are these sort of onesies, twosies? I, I didn't know for the BEV product in particular how you think about visibility building for that as people anxiously await the, uh, the units coming in from Ulm. Jeff, this is Mark. So uh, our target customers for the BEV are very similar to our target customers for the fuel cell trucks. So we're targeting large fleets. Um, and so we expect those orders to be significant. So the, uh, you know, the, the kind of orders you've seen, seen in, the, in the way of uh, Anheuser-Busch that should be exemplary of what we are going to do going forward. Got it. And then is the intent to communicate all of this at, at Nikola World? Uh, it, it's a bit confusing trying to follow Trevor on his various social media outlets uh, about the, the timing and cadence of, of communication of, of the different uh, variables that you're talking about. <clears throat> Jeff, you know, as you're aware, we have a number of initiatives that we anticipate that we'll be able to announce in the second half of the year, and we'll announce them as we execute them. The goal is not to simply wait until the year end, uh, but we believe that we'll be able to announce uh, several initiatives that we have working on uh, over the next six months. Perfect. I'll turn it over. Thanks much. Our next question comes from Paul Coster with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Welcome to the public markets. Uh, it's been fun so far. Um, so, Mark, I, I just wonder, is this is this all we get? <laughs> it's kind of a joke, really, but it's so much already. But, you know, I imagine you've had conversations with many um, customers that are not in these verticals and partners that not are uh, not in these verticals. Is it possible that we'll see this business model expand over the next 12 months uh, beyond trucking and, and beyond the fuel stations? Well, what you have to trust us is there's a lot more going on than, than, you, than you see in the announcements. As you know, we're talking to lots of folks. Um, we were talking to lots of folks before, but now it seems like just about everybody in the world knows about us. We're having lots of conversations with lots of people. And when we are able to announce those publicly, we're going to do it, just as Kim said. Um, a lot of the people we're talking to uh, would like to keep those, comp th those co conversations confidential for now. And so that's one of the reasons we don't announce everything that we got, have going on. But when we have something that we can publicly announce, you're going to hear about it. I will, I'll, I will make one additional to, to Kim's point before. Um, there's going to be a lot of cool things in Nikola World. You want you want to be there. <laughs> we won't we won't wait. You know, if we have something that's material, of course we're going to announce it. We're required to do that. But there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that happens in Nikola World. It's going to be the place to be. Right, but there's going to be trade-offs, right, in terms of how much capital you've got to throw at initiatives and 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 to, you know the the uh, the the possibility of pulled in many directions and and uh, timelines suffer. 
what, what is you're not prepared to sacrifice in, in evaluating those adjacencies? Well, obviously, uh, being focused uh, makes it uh, as important to say no as to say yes. The things that we say no to, uh, we we uh, are very uh, objective and careful to make sure we stay focused on the on delivering the things that we have to deliver. That's why we've laid out the milestones we think you should hold us accountable for, and we're going to make sure we deliver those things. Paul, well, we have always indicated that capital efficiency and allocation is very important. And we understand from the investor's perspective that we are being wise about our spending. We recognize that while we have different product lines, what you will find is that we are, as we announce initiatives, you will find that we are de-risking the process and you will get a better appreciation in terms of how we allocate capital. And we understand from your perspective that this is very important. Okay, just a couple of other quick ones. At the conclusion of phase one of the Coolidge uh, build out, what will you be producing at that plant? We will be producing the Nikola Tray BEV, the battery electric version of the Nikola Tray there. That's and the, and the same. Right. Mark, can you just elaborate what then subsequently happens and, and when the fuel cell? Um, gets produced and will it be from the same facility but a second phase thereof? Uh, the fuel cell the fuel cell truck will not be built until phase three so 20, 2023 is the projected start of the fuel cell build. Now remember we're building this facility to be flexible between the, the different models so we, we should be able to build a, a one, a two, or a tray on this on the same lines in this in this facility. We're, we're following the Toyota discipline of being able to build uh, any one of those three related models on the same line any day. Gotcha. I, I, my last question is: I know there's some concern that you need to pa uh, you, you need to put up a lot of miles of field testing of the fuel cell truck in real world conditions, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of miles. And at the moment, as far as we can tell, there's just one prototype uh, running around. Can you just talk us through how you? Uh, get the prototypes out there in real world conditions as quickly as possible uh, and when that might be? Yeah, we, well, first of all, we have a couple of prototypes that have get, been accumulating track miles uh, since we built them. And we will get prototypes in the hands of our launch customers uh, very first so that they will get the, the, the prototypes the uh, very first. Uh, for example, Anheuser-Busch long ago uh, earn the right to get prototypes from us first. So Anheuser-Busch will be testing trucks from us. We've already we've already pulled a lot of beer from the St. Louis uh, brewery to the uh, to the distribution center there in Missouri. Um, you can see some pictures of that on our website. And when we have the the uh, working uh, first production versions for testing, uh, you're going to see them pulling uh, red trailers. So um, we're going to utilize our our best customers and our pilot and launch customers, the ones that have shared some risk with us, we're going to utilize them to do the testing as well. And that's imminent or already underway? Uh, as I said, we've already we've already hauled a load uh, yeah. with one of our prototypes for, for AB. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Emmanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I appreciate the um, uh, list of milestones uh, that um, you committed to uh, before the end of the year. Uh, I was hoping you'd be willing to uh, share with us uh, some elements of uh, progress and how these various milestones are going, how some of these discussions are. Uh, it feels like some information about it was sort of parsed out, I guess, throughout the last few weeks or, or months. I think there were some uh, you know, discussion around a, a certain a specific number of uh, O OEM potential partners, you know, on the Badger. I think that uh, at some point there was discussion of uh, some of the commercial partner for the hydrogen stations, uh, some interest in there from uh, oil, uh, big oil, oil companies. Um, just anything you can give us in terms of how these various initiatives are are going so far. Well, we we can't go further than what we put out there at, at this point. Uh, but I will remind everybody that we. We did have a public groundbreaking ceremony, um, so you're going to see the activity at the site uh, 
we're on track to get uh, phase one up on time and on budget. And uh, we have talked about the fact that uh, we're going to announce a partner uh, for uh, the Badger and uh, and the other milestones that Kim mentioned. So, you know, you're going to you're going to we're going to you're going to see evidence of progress on that as we go. As soon as we can announce something, we're going to tell you. Okay. Um, any sense on the, you can give us on the uh, on the deposits for the Badger? I know at some point. Um, uh, you discuss, you know, at, at least initially getting 1,500 or so a day. Um, is that um, a, a number you're you're prepared to update yet? Yeah, obvious. Yes, obviously we were we were intending to continue to give you updates, but I'll tell you this Badger story is just incredible because, I mean, we we a year ago we didn't believe we'd be building a a, a pickup truck. Uh, we had some concepts. We have a, a, a great design team, and Trevor is extremely creative with this stuff. And we have built several off-road vehicle-type prototypes, and they had a, a concept for a pickup truck that they that they had, just in concept, um, just as a conceptual exercise. And we didn't intend to do anything with it until we saw the the Cybertruck. And a lot of people didn't like the look of the Cybertruck, <laughs> including me. I thought I think I think it looks like a doorstop. But uh, they've got lots of reservations for it, um, and so there's you know more power to them. We're trying to to get all, the whole world to zero, and it's going to take more than us. So we give it, we cheer them on. But a lot of people didn't like the look of that thing. So Trevor just released the concept that we had for the pickup truck, and people just went nuts over it. Um, and so much so that we said, hey, let's put a let's put a thing on the website that allows people to go in there and and fill out a form and sign up for and say that we're in, we're interested. We ended up with over 89,000 of those people signed up. <laughs> so that's when we got serious about it and said, I think, the, I think the world wants us to build this darn thing, but it wasn't in the plan before. So we said, hey, if we're going to do it, we're going to need a partner. That's our model. If, we get, if we're facing a big challenge with lots of risk, we're looking for partners and help. And so we said, we'll look for a partner. And we got lots of people who were interested in partnering with us. That has gone so far and so fast that we are now in a quiet period. We can't talk about it until it's done. So you're just going to have to wait on that one. Uh, that's exciting. So that's 89,000 um, deposits, uh, anywhere between $250 and, and $5,000 a piece? No, 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 no. The 89,000 was the, the registration on the website. They just That's just ra them raising their hand and filling out a form saying, I'm interested. We Got haven't it. announced we haven't announced the paid reservation since we announced since we said for the first few days, but as I said, now we're we're in a quiet period at this point. We can't go further until that's done, and as soon as it's done, we'll announce it. Okay. If there's one area maybe of uh, questions or a little bit of skepticism is around some of the assumptions around your cost of electric, uh, electricity. Uh, in the future when you know supplying hydrogen um can, can, can you maybe um give us some elements around you know have you had discussions with um electricity companies yet um in any sort of like strong indication that sort of like this kind of uh, input cost is actually um uh, uh, realistic uh or that uh, you would have uh partners sort of like willing to work with you on this absolutely it's a great question um so we can make hydrogen for about a decimal move or better on the, the cost of the electricity. So our, if, if we can get, uh, say, electricity at three and a half cents, then, then we should be able to, to make hydrogen at 350 a kilo or better, um, given our current technology and the current design of our stations. So the key for us to have uh, our target hydrogen cost is for us to get the electricity at the, at the right cost. Um, so what you want to look at is you want to look at the the price of renewable electricity. Uh, that's what we're targeting. We're trying to use the wind and the solar and the other renewable sources of electricity. We want to be all green. That's our target is 100% green. We're going to get as close to it as we can everywhere we go. And look at the price of the renewable, the big renewable projects that are out there. This is one of the reasons we got a big investment from a solar provider out there. We have a big we had a had a big investment in our private rounds from us uh, from Hanwha, which is a big solar panel provider and solar array manufacturer because they can profitably build solar arrays 
and sell the electricity on a long-term basis, you know, for the for the projected life of our stations even, uh, on a fixed cost basis uh, for for our target price. People they can do that. Um, wind, big wind projects, you're going to see the same. The other thing you want to pay attention to is the is the wholesale uh, price of electricity at the major trading points and places where it's free to trade. You're going to see that that price, uh, when it's being driven by the renewables, that price falls way down there. It even goes to zero once in a while and occasionally goes negative when one grid has too much of it. Um, that's the reason we have faith that we're going to be able to hit this hit this number, especially on the average. Some places will be a little lower, some places a little bit higher, but we're going to we're going to be on our average. We're for, we're, we're very confident. And Emmanuel, we are having some conversations in the Phoenix area, and we're getting some indications that it can be uh, below 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And we are also having some number of discussions in various areas about collaboration and various projects where we can achieve that. And that's why that's one of our milestones. I think you're going to see us announce uh, announce uh, some collaboration on the uh, electric energy front and the energy front Great. generally. Yeah, thanks for all the color. Our next question comes from Joseph Pack with Harp. RBC Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Thank you very much, and thanks for the color so far. Um, maybe can you just follow on our last point? Can you um, comment on, I guess, the overlap of renewable electricity, or I guess broadly cheap electricity, and the map for you know dedicated high volume routes that I think you're you're going after um, for the initial fuel cells, because you know, I, I guess you sort of need both, like, or, you know, or, or, or maybe you could just help us understand, like, which is leading which? Like, it seems like when you first presented the opportunity, it was going after some of these dedicated routes that you, you could um, you could quickly, um, you know, sell. Um, and, and how did the overlap with cheap electricity um, fall into that plan? That's a that's a great question. That is the challenge and the opportunity in front of us is to is to cover those dedicated routes that are our target customers. Our target customers dedicated routes between the city pairs that are too far apart to service with a battery electric truck and to get the the trucks to that to that route and to get the fuel to that route at the same time. That's our challenge to provide the the chicken and the egg. That's always been the challenge for hydrogen is to and get vehicles and the fuel in the same place at the same time, especially in the kind of volumes that we need for for, he for heavy duty trucking. So that's been our focus. I'll give you a, I'll give you a test case. One of the city pairs we know we're going to tie together are, is Phoenix and Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles is the location of one of the largest breweries of our uh, launch customer for the fuel cell vehicle, Anheuser Busch. Uh, they have a, a very large brewery in Van Nuys. Uh, pretty much all the beer that, that, that is drunk here in Arizona comes from that Van Nuys brewery because there's no brewery in Arizona, so they have to truck it all. It comes down Interstate 10 to a distribution center in Chandler. And then in, from Chandler, it goes to the points of sale here in the Phoenix metro area and around Arizona. So that's, about, that's an over a 400-mile route. And in order to cover that without losing case, you know, pallets of beer off your load because you're too heavy because of too much batteries, you got to have a fuel cell truck. Anheuser Busch recognized that early on. That's why they re, that's why they placed the 800 unit order with us early on. So we have to tie Phoenix and Los Angeles together, which means we need a station somewhere on Interstate 10 and accessible to Interstate 10 uh, in the Phoenix metro area, preferably on the west side for that city pair, and then uh, another station somewhere in the Los Angeles basin, basin or nearby on Interstate 10. Those two stations will service those trucks. And we can size those stations anywhere from about 210 trucks capacity to 1,000 trucks per capacity plus. Uh, so we can we can fuel up to from 400 up to 2,000 trucks with just two stations for that city pair. And then we build it from there. You know, Los Angeles, we then tie it to San Francisco. There's an Anheuser-Busch facility in Fairfield, California, in the Bay Area. It's also about 400 miles away from Van Nuys. So that'll be another city pair that we tie together early on. And getting the electricity for these for these stations again is is the great challenge and opportunity for us, 
and we are well on our way to having the, the electricity arrangements in place for those facilities. And as you look at the just map, for, sorry, go ahead. It, just for a bit more nuance in terms of the way we think about in terms of when we lock in demand and utilization, we've always talked about we will want to lock in demand first so that we're not risking in, or speculating. So if you think about it, we'll do our best in terms of locking in demand. But as you know, hydrogen station lead time is around 18 months. So while ideally we like to have about 90% plus utilization, it doesn't mean that we will always have lock in demand two years in advance. We'll have a demand locked in, and then over the next 18 months, during the lead time, we will continue to develop and gain customers so that ultimately by the time the station is ready uh, for our customers, we will have over 90% utilization. Okay. Um, maybe, um, you know, I think I saw in one of your filings that there was um, a requirement to deliver some of the test fuel cell vehicles to Anheuser Busch by by 2021. Maybe you could just, you know, confirm that and let us know if you're if you're sort of up to date on that on that timing or, or, or timeline if, if that's a milestone. And also, I, I understand that you can't talk about uh, certain things without customer per permission. But you did mention sort of your newfound publicity. Can you just maybe qualitatively talk about the funnel of your opportunity now versus maybe you know six or 12 months ago? Yeah, so that well, let's take that in both parts there. So the first question is, uh, Anheuser-Busch will be our launch customer for the fuel cell vehicle. How soon will they get prototypes? We do believe that we'll be able to give them uh, test prototypes by, before the end of 2021. Uh, serial production or mass production of the fuel cell truck will, will not begin until 2023. Um, but they're going to test with us. They've been a risk-sharing partner from the beginning. They've helped us with development from the beginning. So they're going to take test trucks and get and accumulate miles for us, and and get data for us. Okay, and the um, the uh, op the funnel of opportunity. Yeah. So the, the great one of the great things about all the publicity that's come uh, from our public listing, and and this this process as it continues is uh, there's not very many people that haven't heard of Nikola now. So you know, people that weren't engaged in discussions with us, they are now. Uh, we had lots of discussions going on before, but it's just it's, it's increased greatly uh, since since this uh, public listing process. So, uh, we're, we every, everybody. Uh, the good news is everybody wants to to do to do business with us, um, and we're in a position of being able to to pick and uh, and uh, purposefully choose who our partners will be going forward. Can I squeeze in one more on? Europe, um, you know, um, Aveco talked about the JV you set up with them. Um, is everything you're going to do in Europe um, through this JV? I think it's for both battery and fuel cells. And they also they also talked about this sort of complete turnkey offering for customers. Is is that similar to your um, fuel cell lease solution in, in the United States? Well, remember the joint venture with Aveco is to produce trucks in Europe. So we have a, a facility that's uh, being modified for mass production of our trucks in Europe. Uh, it will start with the tray battery electric vehicle first, and then it'll eventually add the fuel cell version over there, and it'll build those two versions of our vehicles out of the Ulm, Germany uh, facility that we are, we're just about to finish. <clears throat> we actually have the first uh, five prototypes uh, coming off the the end of the of the facility at this point, and they'll go on the test track here in the next couple of months, and we'll go from there. So that's the plan for Europe. That joint venture is just to build those trucks. Each partner has right to 50% of the output of the facility and and uh, the uh, the production lines there. So everything else. Is uh, you know the energy side of the business uh, and everything else in Europe will be will be Nikola alone, and not to downplay the the joint venture. It's an outstanding joint venture. Aveco has been an outstanding partner for us in uh, in getting our vehicles ready for production here. Um, the the commercial offering in Europe will vary slightly. 
but that will be in common. We are going to offer a bundled lease in Europe just like we do in the United States for the fuel cell vehicle. Battery electric vehicles, we think around the world so far, most customers want to purchase those outright. So we don't think we will be leasing battery electric vehicles. Uh, we think we'll sell those outright and customers will put in uh, charging infrastructure, which we're going to help them with, but they're going to do it themselves in their terminal or their depot. They want to charge those trucks overnight, which is an ideal solution for a battery electric vehicles and uh, in their depot, in their, in their uh, terminal. The fuel cell electric vehicles, that's different. We need to provide the fuel uh, an addition, and that's why the bundled lease may, makes sense in Europe as it does in, 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 in North America. Uh, we'll be offering the, the fuel, the truck, the maintenance, all in a bundled package, freight as a service in Europe, just like we do here. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Joe Osha with JMP Securities. Please proceed with your question. Hi, this is actually Hillary on for Joe. Thank you for taking uh, my question. Um, I just kind of wanted to touch on kind of the grid and, and how hydrogen can p potentially kind of play a role in helping to, to balance that energy demand. And secondly, kind of if you would potentially think about building some of that extra storage kind of in the earlier phase of building out some of these stations or if that's something we would expect to come at a later time. Hillary, that's an outstanding question. One of the great benefits of what Nikola is bringing to the world is the ability to balance the renewable energy that's coming into the grid. As you know, the, the huge challenge as the world transitions from fossil fuels uh, to renewable sources of electricity is that these renewable sources do not produce on demand. They, they only produce when the wind blows and the sun shines, typically. And that's not what the grids are designed for. And that's what people expect that when they flip switches, things turn on. They, they, expect, they expect to have electricity on demand, but the generating sources that are renewable don't produce on demand. They're interruptible and they're variable. So one of the great things that Nikola offers to the world is when we put these hydrogen stations in and we start to get a lot of them in there, it represents a tremendous amount of, of demand for electricity that can match up to the supply. So we can, make a, we can make hydrogen when the electricity is available, and then we don't have to add significant demand to the peak. So typically, most grids around the world have peak of demand somewhere in the late afternoon or early evening hours, and the peak of renewable production typically around the world is, is about solar noon in each location. That's when the solar peaks, and so you got this mismatch between the peak of renewable production. If the wind happens to be blowing optimally around noon and the sun always shines optimally at noon, then you've got way too much power at that point. And then, but you know, sometime around between four and seven o'clock, you don't have enough. Well, guess what? When nickel is there in, in bulk, which we're gonna be in volume, we can take a lot of that extra power at the peak and turn it into hydrogen. And then we don't have to be pulling power when the rest of the grid needs it so badly at the peak of demand. And then on the off, off, the rest of the off hours, we can be taking some of that power that's otherwise wasted right now. When the wind's blowing nicely at night, a lot of that today is just wasted. We'll use that to make hydrogen, which we'll then put in vehicles, and it will be useful to mankind. So we're, we are an answer to prayer to grid operators worldwide because we're going to help balance these renewable energy sources into their grids. And we, we have represented a great bit grid buffer. Remember how much power we're talking about here. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, a, a thousand trucks represents 100 megawatts. 10,000 trucks is, a, is basically a gigawatt. Every 10,000 trucks is a gigawatt of power to keep those trucks on the road if you're using zero emissions. So once you talk about replacing the entire North American fleet of millions of vehicles, then you're talking about hundreds of gigawatts of power that and that's one of the problems with, with looking at the battery side of this. Our battery trucks represent a problem for the grid, too, because guess what? People want to charge their batteries if they're, on the, if they're on the open highway. They want to charge their batteries at the same time as they stop for diesel fuel today, which is breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. So that 5 o'clock stop for fuel is an enormous problem for the grid if they want to charge their batteries quickly at that point. There's, the power is not there. And that's a, that's a challenge for for battery electric vehicles. That's why we like battery electric vehicles for local deliveries in short haul in metro areas where they can return to base and charge overnight, where they don't burden the grid. And we like fuel cells 
that not only have the long range, but can fuel up with hydrogen that we make when the electricity is available. It's really an elegant solution. Regarding your second question about storage tank, that can be somewhat nuanced. As you know, the supply chain is still very early and immature, and storage tanks can cost significant uh, amount. But at the same time, as you know, we anticipate on all of our locations, we will have at least 30 hours of storage. And when you think about depending on the locations and cost of electricity, we understand that in certain locations, we may need to have greater flexibility. And certainly as we think about over time, uh, we know that storage tank cost is going to come down as we have new entrants from supplier perspective. So we will size it properly depending on the geography as well as the cost of electricity. We want to make sure that we have plenty of flexibility. Okay, great. That was the only question I had for you. Thanks so much. There are no further questions at this time. At this point, I'd like to turn the call back over to management for closing comments. So we are grateful for, for your interest and, and thanks for, for, for dialing in. Thanks for covering us. Uh, we're grateful for you guys to doing the great service to uh, explain what we're trying to do to the uh, investing public. Um, we're grateful to have such great result. We uh, we spent uh, we spent I think 11 million less than than you guys were projecting in the quarter. So uh, you know we're showing good discipline on the spending front, and since we're in pre-revenue position, every one of those dollars has to come from our investors. So we know that that's that's critical, and we take that trust very seriously. And uh, we we're committed to continuing that discipline going forward. So appreciate your questions, and we'll look forward to talking to you again in 90 days. Thanks.